I'm pleased to welcome my guest today to the podcast. He's been a strong Cambridge booster for a long time. His family came to Cambridge when he was nine months old. He started out as a young entrepreneur in Cambridge in the late 70s, working in the insurance business. He chaired the local Business Improvement Association in Preston. That's one of the three sisters that makes up Cambridge, for those few unaware. At age 35, he was elected as a councillor for Ward 2, representing the Preston area on Cambridge Council. He was the chair of the city's budget task force for most of that time, bringing in 10 consecutive budgets of zero or lower. Let that sink in for a moment. In 2000, he ran for mayor and lost by a mere 26 votes to another fellow councillor, Doug Craig. After that election, he accepted an offer to become the chief administrator for the Cambridge Chamber of Commerce, where he continues to operate, but now as the president and CEO. I'm very pleased to welcome to the Old Grey Mayors podcast, the Cambridge boy himself, Greg DeRocher. <laughs> Gregory, welcome. It's uh, awesome to be here with you, Rob. Um, <laughs> but I, but I, but I, a little bit worried at the at it being called the old gray mares. First of all, I was never mayor. Um, uh, that's, in my that's mind, <laughs> in my mind, I'm still that 35 year old that ran for council. Oh, aren't we? However, all? <laughs> the only truth to it is there's a little gray on the on the little snow on the roof. So yeah, speak. just a little snow. We it's an audio, so people can't see how much snow. I, I think you're like uh, uh, Colorado, but anyway. <laughs> Look, you and I first met uh, more formally when I ran for mayor way yep. back when in 2010, and at that time uh, I was you know uh, just newly running for something, had never put my name forward, and the first political event I was at was when you interviewed me for one of those chamber video chats uh, to discuss uh, business issues, my first political event. And uh, I think I did well if I say so myself, but uh, it, it provided me with a lot of confidence after we were done. So I want to thank you for being kind enough to get me through that, uh, uh, that uh, discussion. I think it elevated myself in the eyes of a lot of people that I could handle some of the questions that were coming through. Now, mm -hmm. We won't speak about the second time I had a Cambridge Chamber interview when I was running for regional chair. So we won't, we won't get yeah. into that, that beauty. But anyway. That was not with me, though. In all fairness, <laughs> that was not with me. But uh, as, far as, I, hey, as far as I'm concerned, if it's something involving the chamber, it's with you, Greg DeRocher. <laughs> So anyway, no, we won't. Uh, I don't want to be asking questions along the lines of that second interview either. But okay. uh, so you got the, the, the insurance business was a family business, right? That you got into uh, mm -hmm. when you were a young man. So just tell us a little bit about that. A little yeah, bit of history um, on that. actually, uh, my dad was uh, when we were in Windsor, where, where I was born, uh, he was a manager with Lend Life at the time and he got transferred here. Um, when I was nine months old, as you had said, and uh, he continued to run the London Life Branch uh, here in Cambridge for a number of years. And then eventually, uh, one of his agents actually turned to him and said, we should do our own thing. And they said, yeah, and a little insurance brokerage came up for sale in Hespler, and then one in Preston at the same time. So they decided to buy it. And they did. And um, that partnership didn't last a whole long time as the other my dad's uh, partner at the time, he wanted to do something else. He was sick of the insurance business. So my dad bought him out and, uh, and it became a family business. And uh, yeah, he, uh, I went there in probably around 1980, 81, something like that. And uh, later my brother, my older brother actually uh, came into the business as well, Jerry DeRocher. Um, and he was a school teacher and uh, he decided he didn't like school teaching. So he came in the family business and eventually uh, he and I were partners uh, right, going right. through. And um, you must have made it, you must have made it look easy. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I think that's what it was. He, he probably said, look at this idiot. If he can do it, I can do it. Um, but so, uh, so there's a bit of a history nephew, here. Yeah. My nephew, um, Jerry's uh, oldest son, he now runs the brokerage. So it's still operating. Oh, it's still going on. Wow. Congratulations. But there's a bit of history here. Isn't, isn't Carl Kiefer a Preston lad too? Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so there's yeah, a bit of a I, Preston insurance broker connection to politics uh, coming out of Cambridge here. You know what's <laughs> interesting about that, though, Rob, that you bring that up is um, I had my brother is uh, is closer in age to Carl than I am. 
and they actually played hockey together um, mm. in an industrial league years and years ago. Okay. I had never in my life had met Carl Kiefer until in 1991, both of us ran uh, for a uh, council. Right. I was running in ward two. He was running in ward three at the time. And neither I had never, and he came up to me like I was his long lost brother. Hey, Greg, how you doing? You know, and I'm thinking, who the heck is this guy? Like this guy. Uh, but Carl, ended up Carl, be, knew, uh, Carl knew everybody. So <laughs> whether yeah, you knew it or not, a, a great friendship, uh, you know, uh, yeah. he's one of my uh, uh, closest and dearest friends. So uh, it's, it's hard not friend. to like, he's a big lovable lug. He's hard not yeah, to like. Sure uh, so um, before you were foray into politics, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you had some community involvement outside of your business. Uh, I think it was Cambridge Baseball, was it? Was one of those yep. uh, involvements? What, what were yeah, you doing there? I was there? the president of uh, Cambridge Minor Baseball, um, which really kind of tweaked my interest in politics. And, and, I, and I also uh, was the chair of the uh, Preston Town Center Business Improvement Association. And I was also president of the Kiwanis Club of Preston Hespler at the time. Oh. And uh, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I was kind of prodded by my dad. My dad would say, look, I, I put in all these years helping the community. Now it's your time. You got to do your thing. And, you know, right. I was That's nice. I was a little bit of a sucker for that. But but what was interesting when I was with Cambridge Minor Baseball, what was really important, as you can appreciate, were facilities. And, yes. you know, as president, I would get all the complaints from the moms and dads who said, you know, hey, Greg, have you been to that ball diamond? It's a piece of crap. And, you know, you, you know, something's got you're talking about there. Cambridge ball diamonds when they're saying, have you been to that ball drive? Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, yeah. and so inevitably it was every ball diamond needed a little bit of work. So I would go and meet with city staff and, and talk to them about it. And it kind of and, and I'll have to tell you, it was Jim Anderson, who was a city clerk at the time who said to me, and, and actually, uh, I knew him at that point because his son was playing on the travel team that I was coaching. And Jimmy oh, okay. said to me, look, Greg, you know, like you're going to beat your head against the wall trying to get any changes around here. Y you need to be on council, like councils where you can make the difference. So you need to you need to run for council. So you so, need to have a vote. You need the vote. Yeah. And you need to pressure your peers. And, you know, it's easier to convince 10 or 12 at that time, uh, politicians, than it is to a whole department at the city. You're not going to get a whole department at the city. But, but let me ask you this, uh, before you got into politics, had you had some success in getting some changes to the ball diamonds uh, through uh, just community advocacy? Yeah, you'd get a load of gravel now and again to kind of smooth <laughs> out the parking lot. And, you know, they'd cut the grass on Tuesday night when, when you know, when, when, when they games were on the weekend. Yeah, <laughs> the games <was> kind of, <laughs> and it was kind of crazy, you know, because I remember I remember having this meeting in the city and Jimmy King at the time was was the commissioner. And he said, well, Greg, you know, we're we're going through this environmental naturalization thing. I said, naturalization, oh. These are kids, kids running around in a field like you can't have grass, you know, 12 inches tall while they're trying it's to kick run a, or ball. kick a soccer ball through that. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. But. So what about the other groups? Were you connected with the other groups uh, in the community as well and, and finding about their situation with facilities? Yeah, you know, uh, of course, uh, the presidents would usually want like minor, minor soccer, minor hockey. Some of the softball groups, we would all get together kind of, you know, once or twice a year as a group and say, you know, what can we find? Where can we find some harmony? I was a big proponent of saying the arts groups were all doing their own little thing. And, and I used to say, you know, at least the sports groups kind of come together and, and help each other lobby for the things that they need. So, oh. you know, we were, we were, you know, working hard uh, as a, as a collective group and supporting one another when we needed ball diamonds or we needed soccer pitches or we needed arenas, you know, we were kind of all collectively there saying in, in minor sports is really important. It's about, you know, family and social fabric and, right. and, uh, and, and, uh, so. Oh yeah. yeah. Nothing was, like, nothing like from my, uh, experience, like, a, a Tuesday night when it's kids soccer night and you get down when there's like three or four fields, you see everybody from the community out there. I would just go down and walk around and chat with people because they were all hanging out, watching their yep. kids, chatting about what's going on. It was yep. just a great community time, yeah. uh, to get together. So, I'm having deja vu all over again here. Was it facilities that brought you to uh, local politics? 
Yeah, I, I, I actually think that that's, you know, although with my uh, with my role on the Preston Town Centre Business Improvement Association, we, right. we had a little bit of contact with the political sphere. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it was it was really Jimmy Anderson saying to me, look, Greg, if you want to get changes made, if you want to get things taken care of, you, you have to have a seat at the table. And and, you know, I kind of thought about that and I thought, well, what a stupid idea that is. But, you know, well, maybe maybe I should, you know, of yeah. course. 30 you know years old you're kind of young and enthusiastic and aggressive and full, you know, full of stuff <laughs> and you, you don't ever think of the stupid things that could possibly happen but uh, oh yeah trust me when i ran for mayor I, all i thought of it was the facility i didn't think about all the other stuff and regional council and all that other stuff that comes with it like there's a lot of that people don't realize how many different issues as a counselor in a municipality you've got to deal with uh, beyond the maybe the issues you're focused on or, you know, like people complaining about speed on a, in a neighborhood while there's all kinds of roads, buildings, yeah. uh, social services, library hours, uh, fire, water. I mean, there's so many different issues, garbage pickup, things that you got to deal with. Uh, you realize it about uh, January 18th. When you're newly elected, because our elections were in November at that time, and then, right. you know, you're thinking about how to plan for the budget and squeezing in that extra little baseball field or whatever, and your phone's ringing off the hook because somebody's uh, cul-de-sac hasn't been plowed yet. Right, um, right. Know? Yeah, <laughs> and, I know. And I that's know. the issue of the day, you know, so to speak. But. And so it's not only the, um, uh, the affairs of the city, the business of the city you have to deal with. Uh, it's also uh, all the community events that yeah. you get invited to and, and you want to go out to to meet with people and see what's happening in mm -hmm. the community. Yeah, so, and I think that's the te that's where you take the temperature of the community. You know, what, yeah, what, what, what absolutely. seems to be important? But let me. OK, so let's let's pull back for a sec. OK, so uh, you're, you're told, hey, you want to make some change. You got to get on council. So what happened? Well, uh, then I, I, I was actually in the middle of building a house at the time in Preston, and uh, my builder was Rob Thorman, Thorman Construction, uh, old Preston building guys. And uh, Rob said to me, hey, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, spawn, I'll give you some signs. You can make some signs up. <laughs> well, you told so him, you were, did you tell him you were going to run? You were thinking of running or well, you're already he, in? Yeah, he said, no, no, you got to do this, Greg. You got to do this. Of course, he's my home builder. What am I going to do? He's going to still be a crappy home if I don't do what he does. He used, he, he used the material from your house to build. Yeah, so, signs. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it was kind of that's a kind of a funny story because uh, I'll maybe get into that with his son, because, as you know, his son went on to be Scott Thorman, who is. Oh, right. Yes. The Atlanta Braves, you know. And, yes. Yes. And, pitcher. Uh, they, pitcher. They right? Was it a pitcher? Uh, uh, no, he was a first baseman. Oh, and okay. an Outfielder. But uh, but in any event. Um, so Rob brings over like, you know, 10 sheets of plywood and a couple of two by twos. And in my, in my garage, I painted my signs by hand. Right? Okay. Like, and they, and they looked like they were painted. By hand. <laughs> yep. And I went around and said, I mean, this was in 1988 and I went around and set them all up and, and I, and I, and I really did. I wanted to make an impact. I wanted to, I want to let people know that I was out there. I wanted the political influence to come to me and say, Greg, why are you running? And, and maybe I could do it that way without actually doing the job. Right. And uh, but I started to get afraid on on, you know, just about near election day. I, I can remember saying, I, I think I'm going to get elected. And, and I didn't want to get elected. Like I, I, I just wanted to have some. Why, why, why were you running then? Well, because I thought I could get some influence. And if I got to know the mayor and some other councillors and the best way to do that is oh. to run an election. So. I mean, who are you? Okay, hold on a sec, though. Did you have a team uh, with you when you were yeah, campaigning? My my, uh, my uh, six and eight year old, six and eight year old son. I, I ran. I ran for regional chair that way. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but so you had anyway, an incumbent too, right? There was an incumbent. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. There was an incumbent, Mary Love. She had served for a long, long time. But every door I went went to, I'd knock on the door. The people come to the door and. You know, they they'd say, oh, you got my vote. You got my vote. You're you know, I can't stand that. count. I can't stand her. I can't stand her. And I'm thinking like as I'm going through this, because, you know, the first time you run, like you're excited, right? You're yeah. you're banging on every door. You're walking every single street of the of the ward. I, I was really worried. Like I was actually sweating on election night thinking I was going to win. And and of course, I didn't win because incumbency is 
strong really powerful yeah yeah um, it's powerful how close so, were you how close but, were you was it just was it just you and the incumbent yeah yeah i was pretty close i was i was like within about uh now it was a ward so there's like two thousand votes but i was within about 60 or 80 votes i think of okay winning. yeah yeah um, that's close. so she actually served on the. she was the bia rep that i uh, the preston town center so uh, i knew her real well and i said look hey no, no hard feelings i'm just trying to get some influence here no, 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 it's okay. She actually came to me about a year after that election. She got me on a couple of city committees and then came to me and said, I'm not going to run in the next election. So the ward's all yours. And I, yeah, well. Well, to run for, but, but you know what? It was kind of nice that she kind of put you on these committees because that helped, I mean, cut your yeah. teeth a little bit, right? I mean, me a little more knowledge. education. I, I actually sat on the committee of adjustments, was, was which was oh, a really big learning curve for That's me. a good I, one. Jeez. Um, it was a you, great committee. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you, you're you dealing with a lot of issues there and you've got to balance a lot of interests, right? I mean, that, yep. that could get be pretty contentious at times. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So so then in 91, when I when I took it serious and I said, yeah, I'm going to do this, um, it, I have to tell you, you know, nothing's going to haunt me now, but it was pretty easy run. It was a um, eh? I won yeah. by like a thousand votes or some ridiculous thing. Yeah, I think you had about five candidates uh, in total. Yeah, or- yeah. Yeah. And like the next one was, you know, about 600 votes behind me or something like that. So the, in 91, did you, it was because you were so well known in the community or yeah. um, any lessons from the first one that you did differently in the second one or pretty well the same? You pull out those 10, uh, no, those no, 10 no, no. Hand, I, handmade signs. <laughs> I actually had really good signs made for the next one. Um, well, a little bit better. Uh, but yeah, I think it was, you know, I was I'm very involved with the Preston community. You know, we had a Preston business. This yeah. Was a Preston ward. I lived in the ward. You know, I think. Yeah, I yeah think- you're involved. Like, you know what? You're involved in business and sports. It just reminds me of my campaign. So, yeah. like, I had the law office in air, dealt with a lot of people in the community. Um, now, of course, you're, you're dealing with township wide, yeah. but air was the predominant area. And, yeah. and my kids were in sports. I coached kids and, and all of that. So, you know, well connected that way. But it's interesting when you mentioned those 10 signs you sent out. That, the first thing I did was I, I did. I sent about a dozen around the township in some high profile locations, like in July before the election, just to let people start to know whether I was going to be running yeah. or not. <laughs> I, I know, you know, and, you you know, when you're first doing it. You know, in my case, like I had no idea. I thought like 10 signs is going to be enough, right? Like, no, oh, yeah, right. Oh. like <laughs> yeah. now that said, the incumbent never had one sign up. That just shows you the power of incumbency, doesn't it? <laughs> never put one sign up. I don't think she knocked on a door. Um, you know, it, it yeah, it was it, it kind of. It kind of tells you where you sit in the world. <laughs> I know it's that's almost disrespectful. <laughs> oh, almost, yeah. So, uh, but she she was a wonderful lady. I I love Mary. I still see her every once in a while. She's uh, uh, great, great around. character. So, um, so you're starting out. I mean, you have some experience now because you were uh, on the committee of. Did you yeah. chair the committee of adjustments or? Uh, uh, yes, I did. Yeah, for yeah. one, oh. for one, one of the. the <laughs> Three years. Of course you did. What what organization have you been I, on where you haven't been a chair? I, I don't know whether I have sucker tattooed across my forehead that I don't see when I look in the mirror, but uh but yeah, they, they seem to migrate to me like that. So uh you got some words of advice when you showed up the first time, right? At council? <laughs> yeah, yeah. From exactly. uh Bert Bert Boone. Bert Boone. Bert Boone turns to me and he comes up to me right away, walks over to me. I walk in, you know, it's it's it, it's the, uh, it, you know, it's it's the night that they celebrate and they, you know, you get sworn in and all that kind of inauguration, stuff. inauguration, it, yeah, inaugural uh, night and Bert sees me walk into the room and he comes darting over to me like, you know, and I thought, holy smokes, I, like what's going on here, <laughs> sticks his hand out, says, welcome to council, he says, I'm going to give you a word of advice, Greg, before you start, I said, what's that, he says, uh, don't fight the guy that buys the ink by the barrel. <laughs> and, you know, like at that, at, you know, I hadn't been around that much. And I thought, like, what's he talking about? So I remember turning to Doug Craig and I said, did you hear that? And Doug says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, what's he mean by that? He says, eh, just watch out for the press. <laughs> yeah, Doug. Like, at that point, I am so green. I'm thinking press. I want the press. Come to me. You know, right, you're going to get right. all the answers from me. <laughs> all the answers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, what other uh, things uh, did you find important in terms of getting up to speed when you're a new counselor, uh, newly elected? Well, um, right away, you know, I 
well, you know, with a with a math background, right? So I'm I'm really interested in the numbers and crunching. And of course, yeah. I'm trying to do something for my real interest for being there was trying to find some money in the budget where we could build some new ball diamonds or do some new right. building right. An arena or whatever the case may be. Yeah. So of course, I my first thing was I wanted to meet with Jane Brewer, who was the mayor at the time. I said, I, I need to have, you know, uh, your ear for an hour or so. So she was, she was always very good with me. She, she, uh, for some reason or another kind of took me under her wing and uh, we sat down and she said, well, what, what, what is it you want to, you want to do? I said, well, I'm really interested in finding out where there's some money where we can help some of these minor sports groups and, and the cultural groups too, that are, that are looking for money. And she says, well, why don't, why we're going to be starting a master plan um, for um, recreation and, and that kind of stuff. Maybe I'll, Maybe I'll have you chair that. Um, we won't be doing it until the summer. And then she says, you know, we, we're, we're just going through the budget process. So Greg, I'm not going to lay anything on you. Why don't you kind of sit tight and watch the budget go through and how it works. And maybe, you know, you maybe you want to chair the, the budget. But what I will have you do right away is I want you to chair the administration committee. And I said, what? Like, chair? what are you talking about? No, I want you to chair the, I, I didn't even know I had an administration committee. I had to go to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah like yeah. I didn't know. I thought it was, what was the role? Night. What was the role of the administration committee? The administration committee was really all about the finances. It was about the HR. It was about, you know, um, uh, you know, staff positioning and, and, uh, and, and setting priorities for council and, th and things like that, that were, you know, I, really important things and, and things that I love to be involved with anyway, because I really sure. like the But those things you don't really think about when you're campaigning, right? No, I mean but we had a three committee system. So we had planning committee. Uh, uh, we had a, um, a public works committee, which was parks, recreation and uh, roads. And then we had the administration committee. So here I am, brand new, green, 35 years old. I'm chair of the administration committee. And uh I have no idea what. what oh, let me ask you. Let me ask you this. At that time, the mayor got to pick who was going to sit on these yeah. committees. It wasn't like a vote of council or anything, no, right? No. Yeah. No, especially when it was a brand new council. So the second year of council, then you kind of positioned yourself. Who oh, there could be. Oh, there were changes after second year. I remember at yeah. the region, it was fixed for the whole four years, which uh, yeah. was a bit of a surprise to me. Well, but it, yeah. It ended up that I, I found out very quickly that nobody wanted to do any chairing because I ended up being <laughs> chair of admin for the, the you know, the, the three years. I also, the second year though, nobody, there was nobody that wanted to chair public works. So they, you know, they came to me and said, oh. do you want to chair public works? I said, yeah, sure. I'll chair. Public. Well, that'd be so a natural for you because of your interest yeah. in the parks and rec part. Yeah. Right. So by that time though, the second year, you know, by the second year, uh, of, by the fall of the first year that I was actually on council, the mayor had come to me and asked me to chair um, the uh, budget task force and uh, had also asked me to chair a, a, a program or a, a strategic plan for uh, parks, recreation and open space. And of course, that's kind of really why I, I, I you know, I, I went there in the first place. But the, the whole budget process was uh, was so fascinating to me because it, it gave me by chairing the budget task force, I had to know I had to know absolutely everything that was going on, you know, from the, you know, the senior uh, uh, administration meetings, I was going to the senior administration meetings right. to talk about the budget because these are the department heads of the different yeah. roads and and and. Uh, finance. I don't know what what the various departments are, but they're the ones oh, that oversee their. Of, yeah, they oversee the budget for their individual yeah. departments, right? Yeah. So the treasurer, I got really John McIntyre was his name. He's passed away since, but he was he was a phenomenal treasurer. And I remember meeting with him, and I said, uh, "This was coming up to the the, the for my first budget as budget chair." And I said, "John, like, is there something we can do?" And he said, "Well, I don't know." I said, "Look, you know, I'm looking at these reserves. Like, we got." 40 million bucks in, in, in reserves in our equipment reserves. Like, do we have 40 million bucks worth of equipment? And it seems to me, if we have 40 million bucks worth of equipment and we have 40 million bucks 
in the reserve. We, we don't need 40 million bucks because we're not going to lose or have to replace all of the equipment. Right. So let me, let me hold you for a second on that thought for a sec. Okay. So reserves are just ex- give a brief explanation about what a reserve is for anyone well, who's listening. Well, reserves are, you know, I, I think, you know, everybody, we wish we could do that at home more often, but <laughs> a reserve is really where you set certain amounts of money aside for certain replacements of, of different things, right. mostly around a, a capital type item. So some people in business would would understand it more as a kind of a depreciation factor where you put that amount aside so that when you do have to replace things, you've got some money for that. Well, so yeah, the but the difference, day- the difference, so yeah, but the difference, yeah, this is the rainy day fund with real money. Most, oh yeah, most people have like at home though the line of credit. Okay, that's boring on the bank. Most businesses, yeah. sure, they're depreciating, but they're not necessarily setting money aside no. so that they're able to buy. So this is government money, which is basically taxpayer dollars, yep. real dollars that have been set aside in a fund, which is forty million dollars. And that's just one reserve fund right. that you're dealing with, right? right? There, there are so many reserve point- funds. At that point, I asked him, I said, can I, is there any way we can find out? Like, I didn't know, like how many rakes and shovels do we have? Like how much, how much, how much real value in, if we had to replace all of our equipment, how much would that cost today? And when would you replace it? Sort of like a capital, but over what period yeah. of time would you need it? Would you need oh, it all right sure. away? Like, yeah. So they, okay. they did, they did a kind of an assessment. I think we had about $24 million worth of equipment. Okay. So yeah. We have 40 million bucks sitting in the bank. Sitting aside. Yeah. So and what? every year in every single budget, there was more being put into the equipment reserve. Well, what was that? What was that well, from? Well, something that started a long time ago. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of tradition, I guess. You know, oh well, and, we and they, put, nobody questioned it. They no, just kept no. doing it. They just kept doing it. Kept That's doing, we needed kept doing it. fresh so eyes, said, fresh eyes on the scene. So I phoned my buddy at the province at the time. And I said, what do you, what do you guys do? You know, he was in procurement and that kind of stuff. And he says, Oh, what we do is we charge ourselves an hourly rate. If we buy a backhoe, we charge ourselves an hourly rate for that backhoe over the expected term of the existence of that backhoe. So if it's going to last 15 years and it costs 15 million bucks and we charge ourselves 40 bucks an hour you know, whenever that backhoe goes out to a job and that 40 bucks an hour that we charge that goes into the reserve. Oh, that's what they use the in the backhoe. reserve. Okay. So, and that, that charge is basically replaced to replace, replace the, cost. the cost. So yeah, and yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's based on the value of the equipment and the expected life expectancy of the right, equipment. So, right, right. so I went to John and I said, John, you know, why can't we do that? He always he says, we should do that. That's the right thing to do. I said, then, so what, what does that look like? So, about two weeks later, he calls me in his office. He says, I don't know what we're going to do here, Greg. Like, you know, we, we've done all of that. We've looked at the jobs we've got uh, coming up, the capital works that we've got coming up next year and the amount that our equipment is going to be used. And he said, we'll make a capital injection of about, you know, two and a half million bucks into, into equipment reserve. Um, but he said, like, if we base it on that and we have maybe six or 8 million bucks in that reserve for potential replacements. Right. Right. He says it kind of frees up like $30 million. Yeah. Because what do we do with the yeah, 30 ex- million bucks. You know? <laughs> right. And I said, well, I, I know a lot of baseball diamonds that could use some, you know, and, and so yeah. it kind of started down a path of, we reconfigured that we freed up $30 million uh, or a little bit more than that. Maybe. Um, we, there were some, uh, the fire department, for example, they had like 800 bucks in their, in their equipment. Um, you know, uh, yes. like, like in their, they, in their reserve, in their reserve, they had like eight, uh, probably 8,000, but, but it was a ridiculous amount, low amount. Low amount. Money. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like you had fire trucks that were 650,000 bucks, you know, well, so. Yeah, I'll tell you a quick story. So, so my when I got there, same sort of thing. I, I, I they would get this list of reserves at council, but they would never get like a budget updated or anything. No. So they get this list of reserves, and on there listed all the different things. And I said to the treasurer, I said, "Well, what's this one for fire services?" And she really couldn't explain it. So I go to my next meetings with the fire chief, and I say to the fire chief, "What do you need?" 
chief because you know like you sat down with jane to get uh, up to speed i'm sitting with the fire chief and he says well we need a pumper truck but i know there's no money in the budget so he's already trained right to say there's no money in the budget <laughs> and i said well hold on a sec so i phoned the treasurer i said well how much is in this fire reserve amount and she says 380 i said to the chief what do you need for a pumper truck he said 360 i said there's your money he said he almost fell out of his chair i mean this is the thing right so yeah I you're know. You're asking these questions and it's just like yeah. the way we always did it yeah. just doesn't yeah, apply. So we moved a little bit of money, uh, you know, over to the fire department. So we reproportioned it a little bit better, kind of structured it yeah. with some formality. We knew every single time a truck went out to snow plow, it charged back an hourly rate so that we right, could right. place the truck down the road, you know, and, it, and, and everything seemed to be uh, hunky dory from that perspective. I'm not, I'm not sure how, the department heads uh, felt about it. Um, I think the CAO oh. at the time, Don Smith, was a little bit upset because, you know, we we, we went into this cash reserve of forty million bucks. He couldn't sneak money around. Um, not that he, well, not hey, look, that he no, would he... do it inappropriately, but he could. He if if he wanted to do a favor for a counselor, he always had a little pot of dough that he could move money. Yeah, look, from. it's an interesting look. It's an interesting dynamic, right, between the elected official and staff. Who runs yeah. the show, right? Yeah. It's it's a collaboration. It's not one is over the other, although one group, the elected official, gets to vote. Yeah, they get to decide. And at the end of the day, if enough of them vote for staff to do something, staff's got to follow along. So yeah. that 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 sort of is the approach. But so I think. You're, I think but hold was, on, I, I, I want to ask yeah. you though, how did you get to these budgets of zero or less than zero? Did you use well, some of this money? Yeah, yeah. So what what we basically did was, you know, you, it's even though it was taxpayers' money, you can't give it back. You can't just write everybody a check. Or I guess we could have, but that was. Well, but but nobody that. complained about paying. No, it, no, so. no, exactly. <laughs> you know. And so what we did was we 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 then we did not have a, a reserve, a rate stabilization reserve set up. So we right, put that right. in put most of it into rate stabilization we started and, to and just for and for the listeners a rate stabilization is when you have a bad year like maybe you like look at every budget is based on it's like a zero base you don't you don't budget a profit right. you don't budget a loss but you know in the through the course of the year mother nature legal costs whatever can cost result in a deficit yep. and so the, or, the rates or you could you could have a year where all of a sudden you know circumstances prevail Hey, we got to have a ten percent tax increase. Ah, gosh, we're not going to do that. So you drag a couple million out of the out rate and, stabilization and, and, fund, and, and, yeah, and bring it down. So because if well, you, you never you had any, you didn't have any of those ten percent no. scary. If you years. understand what bureaucracy's <laughs> plan is, it's to raise the mill rate every single year, right? That sure. That's how they kind of stay ahead and they keep the wheels going of of uh, of growth and and uh, bureaucracy building, yeah. but. The very first budget, I had just been elected, um, and I'm not quite sure how it happened, but uh, I moved a motion on budget night to, to, and I can't even remember how it worked, but but it ended up that our the very first budget that I was in, we reduced taxes. We actually cut taxes by 1%. So I had ran on that. I said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work hard <laughs> to bring taxes down. No, wow. I didn't know any of that. I didn't know what the heck I was talking was about. Was that your first two months? You did that in yeah. your first two months. <laughs> well, we approved, we, yeah, we approved the budget in January. I was elected in November. Yeah, I yeah moved exactly. The motion, you know, so we're walking out of council chambers. Jane turns to me and says, you must be happy. And I said, well, yeah, but 2% would have been better. She says, holy smokes, what are you trying to do? Drive us into the stone age <laughs> but by, but by that time i now now i kind of understood how things worked the, the fall later and i was i was but, a but greg chair. that that reserve of the 40 million with you weren't using did you use some of that in your you didn't know about that in your first budget did you no 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 I you think, just you just voted you just put up a thing hey let's have a cut of one percent and well, somehow I, they found it yeah, I, I, I can't remember how it happened. I moved the motion that we need to get to X percent and uh, the staff worked it out somehow. But but now I know now I know exactly how they do, did it. And I'll, I'll get into that. But uh -huh. um, because I learned an awful lot of tricks along the way, and I've been trying to help this current council, you know, speaking with some of them to good so that you can figure out how to do some of this stuff. They, they need some help. Yeah, 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 they do. Uh, part so of, the, anyway, part go, of the problem is. Is, yeah, go ahead. Tell me the tricks. How much you debenture? How much you debenture? Right. Okay. So, All right. So you look in the capital budget. Uh, bureau, bureau, bureaucrats will tell you 
oh, don't worry about the capital budget because the capital budget is just things that we do. And, you know, we use development charges and we use government grants and we use, you know, don't worry about the capital budget. It's the operating budget. But there's one line in the operating budget that says contribution to capital budget. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what's short from the uh, from the uh, grants and the <laughs> development charges. <laughs> so so right now, you know, at one point, uh, not now and not, not when I was on council, but at one point, you know, like 10, 15 million bucks a year was being contributed Ooh. from the operating budget over to the capital budget. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that was because somewhere along the way through the 10 year, nine years that I was on council, we passed a motion to go zero debt. Well, hmm. you know, I was arguing against it. I said, no, 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 no. Cause I had shared another committee on, you know, uh, uh, debt limit capacity. And we, we figured out that we could borrow 5 million bucks a year and be, you know, really, really in good well, shape. And- but, but truth be told, Greg, wh- whenever our uh, auditors came to council, they would say, Oh, you could borrow. Like it was a ridiculous amount of money. Yeah. Well, I don't know if, do you remember what, like, I think it was like little township was like, well, you, you have the capacity to borrow up to $80 million or something like yeah. that. Like, yeah, like it a- was crazy. It was a crazy crazy. amount, but no one would do it because, you know, it was always funny to me. Look, you got a mortgage on your house and maybe you got a mortgage, a loan on your car. But as soon as you became a counselor, God forbid you would borrow for anything. You know, it just it just uh, seemed odd to me. And and that's exactly and it works almost exactly the same way, Rob. Like there's fundamental value in a community. Right. So the province looks at it and says, well, you own all these buildings. You got all this property. You got you got this basically guaranteed tax revenue source or revenue source you do that's why banks love to lend to municipalities you know i I think right now the city of cambridge has a capacity of about 400 million dollars that they right it's massive exactly it's just crazy so so anyway what what we got talked into from one counselor because he was he was kind of a working guy you know he brown bagged his lunch to work every and his objective was to get to the day to retire and, and then when he retires, he wants to make sure he's got his car paid off and his house is paid off. So he was thinking the same thing about his municipality when we don't, the municipality doesn't retire. It exactly. It needs to exactly. Stay, stay. It's a living, breathing, ongoing entity. And you Forever. and I and counselors just are, are, right. are uh, caretakers for a period of time yeah. before we pass the baton on to somebody else. So, so think about this right now. If you, if, if, if uh, back then, and, and this is where it happened. So I think we were probably moving about four or five million dollars a year um, from the operating to and injecting it into the capital to do all the capital works. If if council does a crazy thing and says let's reduce taxes by one percent, all they do is they 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 well at that point three hundred thousand dollars two hundred fifty thousand dollars was one percent of the tax bill. Right. All they would do is they would. They would just borrow an extra two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and and that would that would solve the problem. You could bring taxes down by one percent. So, so you're not bringing right, taxes down by reducing staff or anything, yeah. right? So I re- I remember going in and sitting down with a couple of counselors in this current council and saying, okay, you're moving ten million dollars from the operating budget over the capital. I said, if you were to borrow five million of it. And not not move all 10 million, just borrow 5 million for the capital works. I said, 1% of the Cambridge budget right now is $1 million. I said, you could cut taxes by 5%. Yeah. Because you're not going to take the 5 million directly out of the taxpayer. You're going to borrow it and pay it over 15 years or something like that. So so that's how I think they operated. But there were other little tricks along the way. So. Uh, uh, partway through the term, I think about halfway through my nine years, uh, Bill Brown was a former fire chief for the city of Cambridge. Yep. Rick Castle was in Ward 1. He runs for mayor against Jane and loses. Bill Brown, though, ran for Rick Castle's ward seat in, uh, in Hespler. Yeah. So Bill Brown's sitting right beside me in council. We're coming up to our first budget meeting, and I'm really frustrated because it looks like we're going to have a one percent increase in taxes and i'm you know and i committed to my taxpayers i campaigned on the fact that i'm not going to raise taxes tax fighter 
The tax fighter. Tax fighter. <laughs> yeah, because I really didn't understand the whole scheme. <laughs> right I, and I was young and stupid, right? So yep. anyway, so I'm sitting there and we're getting right down to the wire. Like it's almost, it's almost time for the mayor is going to say, okay, everybody in favor of the budget, all hands up, you know, and it's yep. going to be a 1% increase. I turned to Bill Brown and like I, Bill and I were pretty good buddies at that point. I turned to him, I said, I'm not voting for it. I'm not voting for a budget that's 1%. He says, well, what's 1%? What's, I said, it's three, at that time, it was about $310,000. He said, oh, okay. He says, you want to do something? I said, what? He said, well, I'll second it if you move it. I said, what, what, what? <laughs> right. He said, increase increase the build, building permit revenue by 310000 bucks." <laughs> I said, what do you mean? What's that? I said, but you know, our planning commission is going to be pissed off. Ah, uh, don't worry about it. They always build in some fudge in there. They always, they always <laughs> underestimate the revenues and they get more. He says, you know, don't worry about it. So uh, last minute, it's almost last call for any, any more changes. Yeah, to the yeah, yeah. I put my hand up. Jane looks at me and says, Councillor DeRocher. I said, yeah, I'd like to move a motion that we increase building permit revenue by $310,000. Bill Brown right beside me says, I'll second that. And, uh, <laughs> and Jane, Jane looks around, God bless her. She looks around and says, is there any discussion of the motion? Not one hand went up. And she said, okay, all in favor, every hand went up. And then I turned to the, to the treasurer and I said, Mr. McIntyre, uh, where are we at right now? And he comes in, he says, 0%. I said, perfect. I'll move the budget. <laughs> so, so, so Doug Craig's thinking, wow, there's someone else who's going to be a, a troublemaker on council besides me. <laughs> but you know, here, in all fairness to Doug, Doug was on regional council at the time. Doug, like both ask, at that time, was yeah. he regional council or he was yeah. on city Cambridge council and regional at the time, yeah, right? Had, yeah. They were on both at that the double time. elect. Yeah. Double yeah. elect. And, yeah. And he, he would always come to me and say, look, I'll take care of the regional budget. And yeah. you and I'll follow your lead on the on the local on the Cambridge budget. And I said, yeah, yeah, Doug, that's fine. No problem. But after a couple of years of doing that, I turned to Doug and I said, Doug, how come we're always at zero and the region's always at two or three <laughs> percent? Like you're not doing you're not holding up your end of the bargain. here, Right. So let me ask you, though. Um, so you, that development charge or not development charge, sorry, that reserve, uh, the equipment reserve yep. that helped you during those 10 budgets or nine or 10 budgets to get at zero or less than zero. Was that a big part of it? Well, where it really helped was as you, at that time we were carrying about $60 million, 50 to $60 million in debt. And, and where it really helped was, as you know, the servicing of the debt comes out of the operating budget, right? Right, right, so right. So what we were doing is we were taking big chunks of that money and we we're paying down the uh, debt. So it freed up the so, interest payments. So yeah. freeing up the interest and, and principal payments out of the operating budget. Yeah. So it allowed us to keep those. You know, I think at the time I was a budget chair for, you know, eight of the nine uh, of the of the nine years, ten, eight, uh, nine of the 10 budgets that I was involved with. And Don Smith knew unconditionally that uh, he couldn't have his budget chair not supporting a budget. And he knew I wasn't going to support a budget that had an increase. I just wasn't going to do it. What about, so, you must have good assessment growth going on in Cambridge during, oh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. during yeah, that, that time, right? And that helps. So like we had, <laughs> we had, you know, four, five, I think we had one year about seven, eight percent. Uh, assessment growth. Yeah, that, and and just for everyone listening, assessment growth is like residential and commercial development, industrial development that's going on, and that increases the tax base and the amount of tax revenue, property tax revenue that you're able to collect uh, yeah. on an ongoing basis. And 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 assessment growth is the determination of what percentage of that can go towards your your property tax. Like it helps right. reduce your property tax increases. Yeah, yeah. So you know, you I get I suppose if you're if you, if you were really you know, thinking, you know, ultra conservatively, you would say, well, if we had 8% growth, then let's take 4% of that, put it into the budget for growth and take the other 4% and give right. taxpayers a break. But you're not going to, you know, you, you can't do that. And, and one of the, one of the reasons why you can't do that is the only, the only way for growth and revenue and to cover growth and expenses is for municipalities to increase taxes slightly. So we went through that 10 years of no, no increase. In fact, you know, the net was a 1.5% decrease in taxes overall. Um, 
and it, and it probably it probably paved the way for some large increases after that. I, I would say so because assessment growth doesn't go on like large assessment growth doesn't go on forever. And North Dumfries had that too. You know, Mayor yep. Joe Martins, right? Had I don't know fourteen consecutive zero budget yeah. zero tax increase budgets don't, because don't they forget, had that was 80 that was 91 that i got elected in 87 the toyota plant opened uh okay yeah so that really f- helped growth <laughs> oh, flourish man, like, yeah like yeah subdivisions yeah. Plans of, you know they were just coming in like crazy. but in our situation in north dumfries which i think probably doug might have faced when he was mayor in his first budget was after you're going with zero assessment gro- or zero property tax growth for a long period of time the piper comes calling at some point and then you're kind of stuck without a good yeah. assessment growth. You got to go back. There's only one other source yeah. to go to and that's the property well, the, taxes. The problem is you're dealing with unionized uh, uh, union agreements that, yeah. you know, employees are getting uh, raises. Um, you're, you're, as you get assessment growth, you need to hire more people because the community is bigger and there's more yeah. things that you need to tend to. Yeah. So, more roads so to your plow. expenses, your expenses climb, but, but I'm always shocked at the fact and, the, you know, what really kind of, you know, bothers me, I guess, to some degree, although it's 30 years later now. But I look back at when I first got on council it was about, you know, $280,000 to $260,000 was 1% on the, on right. the mill rate. Now it's a yeah, million yeah. dollars on the mill rate, you know, like. <laughs> mine, oh, mine, was, oh. mine was 30 grand for 1%. So, yeah. <laughs> so you couldn't do much for that. But you know what? I think your experience on budget, whatever people think, um, is it's more about asking the questions. Why are yeah. you doing this this way? Even if you don't know, don't be shy. Nope. Like a lot of counselors I, I talk to, you know, they're shy. They don't want to look dumb or stupid or something yep. like that. You know what? Just ask the questions. It's the only yeah. way to learn. Get some, you know, get some lashes going here. Get, yep. get it figured out and, uh, and, you know, take your lumps. Uh, but ask the questions and don't always go with, this is how we always do it. Yeah. I, I, you know, I have an easy time developing relationships with people and it's probably just my persona or whatever, or my insurance salesman enough. Yeah, Maybe, maybe it's a little (laughs) bit of that, but I'll have to tell you every single senior bureaucrat at the city of Cambridge, when I was on council, you know, welcomed me into their office, opened up their drawers and yeah. filing cabinets and you know right. and, and were very patient with me and going through and telling me yep. why things had to be a certain way and uh you know like i know um i know for a fact that i knew more about the operations of the municipality than any other member of council because, yeah by the end of it for sure because yeah. you dug deep in exactly now let's yeah. i want to move on i want to move on to facilities yeah. here um the master plan that you talked about. So you're working on a master plan for facilities, recreational facilities. Is yeah. that what that was? Parks, parks, recreation, and open space. So it was, it was everything, even cultural. You know, we we uh, established a cultural center uh, at the David Derwood Center. You know, all kinds of, all kinds of cultural activities around there. We tr- we tried. We started the momentum of uh, live uh, professional theater uh, from that uh, okay. committee as well. Yeah, uh, but but predominantly what was being we were being pressured for was um, uh, the aquatics and uh, and the ice surfaces were. Yeah. Really and so before we get to that, though, one of the things I think that important is as your community is growing, it's vitally important that you make sure you've got services that are keeping up with the needs of the community. And the only way to do it is through these things called a master plan, which is taking an in-depth look at where your community is at and what their needs are and then eventually figuring out what you can afford to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's only so much money. Yeah. Um, uh, But there, you know, uh, Ian McLean always says to me, he says, you know, people are people are not willing to pay for the government, the the amount of government that they want, that they want. Um, And 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 that, you know, that is the problem. So, you know, I used to say to people all the time, well, you want a 10 percent increase in property taxes? No, no, no. Well, then, you know. Don't be screaming so loud for that thing that you want. So let's talk about aquatics for a second. Uh, Is that what the why on Hesper Road was about? Yeah. So um, I got a phone call from John Lennox at the time. He was on the chair of the board for the YMCA. They they were down in Queens Square, um, uh, where the seniors home is right now. And uh, they wanted to move and they had this piece of property and 
Uh, Mike Farnan was the uh, um, MPP for Cambridge right. at the time, and, and, NDP, and NDP, right? NDP. Yeah, and they and they were the government at yeah. the time. So yeah, uh, interesting. So uh, he had actually had a meeting with uh, the YMCA and and had said he had made a commitment that they would give one point five million dollars towards the YMCA new construction if if they could get the city on board with a million dollars in contribution. So, um, so they came, they phoned me because I was head of this master plan and uh, for parks, recreation, open space, sat down with me and uh, said, you know, we'd like to get a million bucks. And I said, yeah, well, there's lots of people out there that want to get a million bucks. <laughs> um, and I said, you know, what we are looking at though, is we are looking at, there's another need for an indoor swimming facility. Um, because at that time we were turning too many people away for, for, uh, uh, rec, not just recreational, but swimming lessons. Swimming is a huge so, demand in a community. Huge, 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 yeah. huge. So anyway, um, they said, well, you know, well, we're going to have a pool. And I said, yeah, but you're a membership organization. That's a little bit of a problem. Like, you know, how can, how right. can, how can every community member participate yep. in funding your organization when not every community member is welcome inside your facility. Good point. So they came back, they said, Oh, I get what you mean now. And so they came back with a proposal to give us a 40 year agreement with uh, the YMCA for in exchange for a million dollar contribution where any citizen, a resident of uh, Cambridge could go in for a swim uh, for exactly the same amount of money as they would pay at John Dolson pool or Johnson pool and Aspler. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and had, you know, basically prime time type of swimming opportunities for them. Yeah. Well, that was kind of a no brainer because, you know, four and a half million dollars to build a new indoor swimming pool. Uh, we could do it, you know, for a million bucks, even if yeah. we eventually had to build another one, maybe 20 years later, it was still a good investment sure. to have. And the, and the operating costs on these facilities oh. are huge too. On a, on a Nobody wants pool. them. Like, I, oh, you know, I, I can remember saying to them, like, I don't know why you guys, why the YMCA has a swimming pool. Like you're nuts. And they said, yeah, well, you know, we lose our shirts on swimming pools, but if we don't have a swimming pool, we're, we don't have yeah. any. And, and how long was the city relationship for that pool with the Y? How, was there a timeline on that? 40 years. 40? 40. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So 40 years, which makes me, which reminds me, we'll talk about later the Conestoga college situation, yeah. but uh, you know, there's an example of where you set up a situation. You're relying on, on another organization. You got it for 40 years, likely go on after 40 years, probably yeah. if it, if push came to shove, yeah. but um, I'm going to ask you about uh, ice park in a second, but yeah. uh, I want to just Galt arena. What was the yeah. story behind Galt arena? That's maybe my favorite little thing, you know, it, it uh, we, we knew something had to be done with Gall Arena Gardens. The permafrost went down about 28 feet into the ground. Um, there were real challenges there. Uh, uh, the, uh, the ice surface wasn't moving because it was solid ice below it, but right. the walls were moving around it. So there needed to be massive reconstruction of that. So actually staff were first came out and said, we need to abandon the building and build a new arena to replace it on site so, on that site. No, they were going to find another site because, you know, first of all, it was a hair. It, it had a heritage designation on the front, right. although it was all covered up, but in any event, um, so, but we couldn't get anybody out to the public meeting. You know, we wanted to talk about the future or redevelopment of, of uh, Gall arena gardens. You know, we get five or six people out, you know, and yeah. that would be it. So, so Jim King says to me, he says, I don't know what, what you think about this, Greg, but he says, I was thinking about putting an ad in the paper saying, uh, uh, come in here, uh, come and discuss the future of all arena gardens. The proposal is um, either refit or re uh, rebuild the Gall arena gardens in its present, in its uh, older glory, or tear it down and build a new one somewhere else in the city. Well, you couldn't get another breathing soul in the council chambers after that <laughs> because as soon as they heard it was going to be torn down and right, right. Came out. but <laughs> it, it, at the end of the day it achieved the goal that I, I wanted to see i really wanted it was the oldest and still is the oldest continuously operating arena in the world 
Yeah. And and I wa- I thought that that was significant and why yeah. not have it right here? And uh, so the cost of, to build a new one would have been about 7 million bucks. The cost to redo this was was pegged at four and a half million. I think we actually ended up around 5.2 or 5.3 million. But it, you know, if you go into Gold Arena Gardens today, it's spectacular facility. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The rafters, and, the wood. Yeah, it yeah, is. Like, yeah, like and, and you couldn't, you could today, you couldn't, you couldn't replace it for five million bucks. It cost you no. twenty five million. Bucks. Well, you, you know, in the seventies, a lot of those uh, roof truss uh, arenas after was it the Listowel one that or some one of them yeah. collapsed, right? That they all got yeah. changed over. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting because I remember getting a phone call. I would get oh, tons of phone calls from Wayne Taylor, who was a commissioner of of community services at the time. And he'd phone me whenever there was a problem down there. Cause I'd have to go and ask counsel for a little bit more money. He phones me. He says, you got to come down right away. He says, we've revealed something that we don't know what to do with. So I, I go down there and he takes me up on this lift and it's up to the ceiling. And I, all I see is like peeled paint and we get yeah. up there and we got the contractor with us and he, he had sanded a piece off cause they were going to sand it and repaint it. Right. Right. And it was, like this special fur from British Columbia or something you you can't get anymore. Okay. And, and like he says, Greg to replace that, like would be, you know, a million dollars just in lumber. He said, I'd hate to put paint over top of that. Wayne was a bit of a woodworker too. He says, you think you could get $50,000 from council. We need to, sandblast oh strip off, strip the paint off it yeah. yeah and we're and we're gonna refinish it and yeah beautiful and i said oh geez yeah what's fifty thousand bucks we're, we're <laughs> you're in, you're in deep you're in deep already <laughs> so uh, where'd the funding for this come from was it all financed by city of cambridge yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i i think there were um i i think we we got a about a 1.2 million dollar provincial grant at the time for right. uh, rehabilitation of uh, of uh, recreational facilities yeah okay so let me let me okay so you're basically refurbishing an existing arena so that's not adding any more ice space you added you twinned the hespler rink correct during that your time was after the ice park Okay, so let's talk about Ice Park then. So how did Ice Park come about? And that that is yeah. where we're going to talk about. Like, we don't have a whole lot of time, but I want to talk about the public, yeah. private, and all that sort of thing. Go okay. ahead. Well, we 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 kind of we blew the wad on 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 the uh, Gold Arena Garden, so it was a little bit of a problem. Um, and the ice user group still wanted more. Uh, so I I heard about this company out of uh, London who did private developments of uh, arenas. And uh, I can't remember the name of the group now, but because anyway, yeah, it wasn't thought, Buckingham, right? Buckingham's no, there it today. It was somebody wasn't else. Buckingham. It, was, it, yeah. was, it was two brothers, actually, or two brothers. Okay. Anyway, I got a hold of this guy and he came down. He says, yeah, we've been looking in Cambridge. And he says, but, you know, we have some criteria. And I said, what's the criteria? He says, you know, we need about 15 acres of land and uh, to put uh, uh, the facility we want to put up. And he said, um, it's all at our expense, but we, we got to buy the land for 50,000 an acre. Okay. And I'm thinking, holy smokes. Like, you know, even at that time, like our industrial land was going for, you know, 180, 190,000 yeah. an acre or something yeah. like that. And yeah. So I can remember going to Don Smith and saying, we need to find something. And they wanted to be as close to the 401 as they could, because, you know, yeah. that's the traffic they're looking yeah. for. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So Don says 50,000 bucks. Like you can't, that's bonusing. Like we'd be in trouble with the problem. Right. right. And bonusing you know, is where a municipality is aiding on the purchase by providing subsidizing in a sense. Right. Which is not yeah. allowed. So yeah. we couldn't do that. Yeah. So anyway, Don phones me on a weekend. He says, I got an idea. I said, what's the idea? He says, we got, we got f- actually 15 acres of land on Franklin Boulevard that he says, it's kind of landlocked. Like nobody wants to build there because they can't, we can't get them the access that they want. And quite frankly, like transport trucks going in and out of Franklin Boulevard is not what the region yeah. wants to see. Right. Yeah. It's he says, road. he yeah. said, you know, passenger traffic, that's different. He says, you know, maybe we can cut them a deal. And I said, well, what's that? He says, well, if they come into town, he said, why don't we give them the land for uh, uh, in exchange for um uh, hours of prime time ice that we right. can rent, we can give to our minor uh, yep. youth organizations. 
So I phoned the guy up and I said, Hey, you know, let's have a meeting. We had a meeting with it. And they said, so what do we pay for the land? Nothing. You're, you're just, that, that's it. Well, what about it's zoned industrial? Don Smith says, it doesn't matter. The city owns the land. We can put <laughs> yeah. on anything we want to put on it. <laughs> and if it's got a municipal component, which this did, um, it, it it's not, not a problem. So we got 20, uh, 28 hours a week of primetime ice um, from them for the use of that property. Um, and it's still in the hands of, of the city of Cambridge. City of Cambridge yep. still owns the land. Yep. Um, and, and we got primetime access to it and we solved a problem for and and it was really a piece of industrial land we couldn't sell we tried to right sell it right right that's a real so, win-win situation oh it was it was now you know here's where the problem is so i go out and get, knit this deal together and and the user groups go oh greg oh you're great and then it gets then it gets built and then they complain that they can't sit down there on the ice because they want to scream and yell. Yeah, I know. I've, I've, I've watched some stuff there. It's not the best viewing. It's uh, terrible. It's, it's <laughs> terrible. But but you know what? Like I was saying, well, you're at least your kids on the ice. Like, right. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 We, we also did at the same time. It was uh, the Cambridge Center was coming up. Right. It was being built. And uh, uh, just just maybe a little bit before that. Um, and, and we actually convinced uh, John Van Hastrick, who originally built the Cambridge Center. We convinced him to put uh, all to right put the, a, the arena in there. Yeah. Um, so Carl Kiefer, myself, and Doug Craig went and met with him out at the mall when they were under construction, and we just said, you know what, like, you know, you got to put you got to put an arena in here. And he looked at us like, are you crazy? So yeah, he actually that's... got in an airplane and he went out to Edmonton and he went down to Atlanta. I guess they've got one in Atlanta. And he came back and he said, you know what, maybe it's not a bad idea. So. Uh, they put the they put the ice pad in there, of course, amongst all kinds of complaints from people. Not big enough <laughs> ice surfaces. You know, I can't. My my kid doesn't hear me when I yell and scream at them. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, I used to watch my my daughter played some hockey uh, on that uh, on that pad. So it was, it's yeah. a unique spot. It's you know it's interesting. It's fun. It's so different. then just shortly after that we twinned. Uh, Hespler Arena was always was, was always built to twin. Yeah. Um, it, it was it was built that way. The property, everybody knows the property was huge. Um, and, so, and you, so, so you gave so Jane got her name as mayor on a lot of facilities. Uh, and I always joke with Doug Craig. I don't see any facilities with his name on the plaque as mayor. So. <laughs> well, in my nine years, I we I, I was able to get uh, uh, four uh, ice surfaces in. Yeah, and, that's, and that's pretty think, good. I think it was only uh, uh, two ball diamonds. Which... Well, listen, Greg, only two ball diamonds, and that's what the whole purpose was. Anyway, listen, I just want to say, you know, you were a city builder then. You continue to be a city builder and Cambridge booster through the chamber today. And I want to thank you for sharing your stories with us. Uh, always a pleasure. Uh, thank you for listening to another edition of the Old Gray Mayors podcast. If you have any ideas for stories or people you would like us to interview or reach out to, please feel free to contact us. And thank you again.